Welcome to our study on the book of Ephesians. This is session 11B1. And it, this is the positions of governmental authority. We've been on this for a couple of weeks. At the end of the last session, I made a statement, and I'd like to enlarge upon that statement. Now, you may think I'm fixing to just chase a rabbit trail here, but actually, we're going to kind of pull double duty because while I'm detailing that statement I made last week, we're actually going to be able to discover some things about these positions that we have been studying. Now, here's my statement that I made last week. To the best of my knowledge, the Lord Jesus Christ does not occupy a throne until he returns to this earth to set up his kingdom. Now, it's true that following his resurrection from the dead and his ascension back to the Father, that Christ was exalted to be seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all those positions of governmental authority. Let's read about that in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. It says, Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And while this is an exalted position for God's Son, it is not His throne. Now last week, remember, we saw Solomon. His mother came in to ask something of him. And what does he do? He honors her by having a, a, play, a, a seat put right next to the, on the right hand of His throne. And he seats his mother right there beside him. And what was he doing? Well, you know what? He was honoring her. He was exalting her. He was showing her the respect for his mother. And, but that was not a throne for her to rule from. In the same way, Christ is in an exalted position until his enemies are going to be made his footstool, just like David prophesied in Psalm 110. Take a look at it. In Psalm 110 it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now the Lord himself is going to quote David out of the psalm during his earthly ministry. Look with me at Mark chapter 12 and verse 36. For David himself said by the Holy Ghost, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now... Look, I'm not trying to get off track, but I can't help it. It reminds me of the little boy that they were studying, Mark 12, 36, in Sunday school. And so his mom and dad are asking him on the way home from church, what would you learn in Sunday school today? And he said, I, I, I think God does everything with his left hand. And his mom said, why in the world would you think that? He said, because Jesus is sitting on his right hand. So you have to appreciate a kid that takes the Bible literally, I guess. But, but this, is the, this is Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. Now Peter, on the day of Pentecost, acknowledges the fulfillment of this prophecy. Take a look with me in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses... Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, the first point I'm going to make is that even though Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, by the way, where is he right now? In this dispensation of Gentile grace. He is still seated at the right hand of the Father. It is a place of exaltation, but it is not a throne in the sense of He is ruling over something. If you talk about the earth, let me ask you a question. 
Is Jesus Christ ruling over the earth right now? He is not. Even though he's ascended far above all prince, power, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, is he ruling over the heavenly places right now? He is not. So the point I'm trying to make here is that even though he is at the right hand of God exalted, he is not seated on a throne yet. In the extension of mercy, now if we look, look right up here, I don't have my laser pointer, but we're, to the right of the cross where you see Acts 1 through 8, that's what we call the extension of mercy. And in that extension of mercy, which is part of which program? The prophetic program or the mystery? Prophetic, thank you. Part of the prophetic program with Israel, the Lord Jesus during that time is referred to as a prince. Take a look at me, uh, with me at a couple of verses here in the book of Acts. Now remember, it's Acts 1 through 8. That's the extension of mercy. So look in Acts chapter 3, and it says, and they talking about the crucifixion. This is uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, Peter talking. He says, and killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are all witnesses. Now let's move a couple of chapters over to Acts chapter 5. And look what he's called. It says, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now, to give repentance to Israel... That's the purpose of the extension of mercy. That they're giving them another opportunity. What does it mean to repent? It means to change your mind. He's giving them another opportunity to change their mind about Jesus of Nazareth being the prophesied Christ of Israel. And so that tells us that this is in connection with God's prophetic program with Israel. And by the way, in Acts 5... Paul hasn't even received, he hasn't even gotten saved on the Damascus Road yet, let alone received the revelation of the mystery. Now, why is the Lord here in Acts 5 called a prince? Because a prince is a king in waiting. Everybody understand that? He's going to be, I mean, it, uh, if you're talking about earthly princes, there may be a pecking order of you know, who's where, but if something happens, you know, well, then they're going to be in line. At his second advent, the Lord is called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, we're going to look at that in, in a little more detail in just a minute. But the reason that Christ is referred to as a prince is because Satan is presently called the God of this world. Now, there are principalities and powers which have been given authority. And they've been giving ruling influence over the earth and over men. And at his coming, the Lord Jesus will remove those principalities and powers and install his sons and daughters into those positions of authority in the heavenly places. Now, we all, we all know about that. Now, following his ascension, the son is seated at the right hand of the father as a prince awaiting the day when he will be made king. And that leads us to talk about a big misconception in the minds of lost people today. And I just want to bring this into our thinking for a minute. The lost world really has a way of looking at the world and how messed up it is and how evil it is. And they're saying, if your God is all-powerful like you claim he is, how in the world can you follow him when his world is such a wreck. And the, and the thing that I want to say about that is because you're blaming the wrong person. God has not yet taken to himself the power to rule this world. Who's ruling this world? M men are, are ruling and who's ruling the men? Yes, the king, Satan's realm, specifically 
principalities and powers. Now, before we started recording today, I talked to you about a couple of issues that I said we're going to be enlarging on. It. One of those was the spiritual warfare issue. I'm going to, and that, when we do that, rather we do it as a part of the Ephesian study or the Corinthian study or we do it as a whole separate thing, I'm going to be talking to you about how principalities and powers actually carry out that work of influencing men to do the things they want them to do. Because if we don't know how that's happening, then there's no way to defend against it. And I think it's important for us to get that. But the point I'm making here is the power was given to rule, was given to principalities and powers, and they're the ones who have instigated all of the evil and the corruption that's in the world. So if you're blaming God, you're actually blaming the wrong one. You should, you should know that there is going to come a time when God is going to take that power and He is going to rule the world. And when He does, things will be very different. Now I want to take us over to Daniel 10. For most of us, this is a very familiar passage. So I think we can go through it pretty quickly. But the background is that, remember, they've been 70 years in captivity. The 70 years is now up. Daniel is now praying to the Lord He's fasting and he's saying, Lord, okay, what happens now? The 70 years that Jeremiah talked about have come and gone. Is there going to be, is there something else? Are we going to go back home? What is going to happen? And so he's been praying there. He doesn't get an answer and so he keeps praying for three weeks, the Bible says. Now God dispatches a messenger to the earth to give Daniel the answer to his prayers. But that messenger is held up for 21 days. So listen now, with that background, let's start reading. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. Now what we're going to read next is a description of the messenger. So we'll pick this up now in verse 5. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body also was like the barrel, his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Now, you have to say to yourself, I'm going to interrupt this just for a moment because this is, this is going to come into play again when I'm talking to you about how Satan is working in the world. There is a way that the spirit world will communicate with mortal men. Now you have to, and, and that's actually going on here with, with regard to God and not Satan because you understand that Daniel says, but I alone saw the vision. Now I don't want to get off into this today, but I want you to think, isn't it a little bit remarkable? He says, the men that were with me didn't see the vision but a great quaking fell upon them. You have to almost ask yourself why. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever done this or maybe it's even happened to you, but sometimes in counseling sessions when a stronghold has been built up in the life of an individual, they may say in a counseling session something like, do you see them? And the counselor would look at that, and they don't see anyone. Now, we'll explain when we talk about spiritual warfare what is going on with that. But you, have to, but you understand that Daniel sees something, but the men that are with him don't see anything. But a great quaking fell upon them. And you have to, you, I, I mean, when I read that, I have to say, if you're not seeing it, I mean... I mean, let's suppose that Gloria suddenly leaps to her feet and goes, Snake! <laughs> and, 
and immediately, what are the rest of us going to do? Okay, Barbara goes, run. Okay. All right. Did you, what did you say, Linda? Oh, you said, look. Barbara's running. Linda is looking. Okay, so I was looking for look. Okay. We're going to, because we want to know where it is, right? Now, if, if Gloria, if Linda goes, where, Gloria? And she goes, it's on me. <laughs> but when Linda looks at her, she doesn't see anything. What are you thinking? Well, it's just Gloria, right? <laughs> okay, no, all right. So we're, okay, so if you don't see it, you're not quaking because of what you don't see. If you're fearful, it's because something is happening to someone. Visib it's visibly happening, let's say, to Gloria. And you're not sure what's going on. So yeah, it can be frightening. But it's not because of the messenger. By the way, that's a pretty fearsome appearance, wasn't it? A face like, I mean, uh, if I, uh, uh, he says, um, oh, I passed it up. It's, it's not on there. Um, but he talks about uh, his, his body was like the barrel. His face is the appearance of lightning. His eyes as lamps of fire. His arms and feet in color like unto polished brass. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. That's a pretty ominous thing that Daniel is seeing. Now let's continue to read because something happens to Daniel here. He says, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Barbara was in that group. <laughs> She's going to run. Okay. Now, verse 8. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then I was in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. Somebody want to put that in the present day vernacular? Yeah, he's passed out. He's just in a coma on the ground. Why? Well, this is a pretty frightening spectacle. And uh, so let's keep reading. Uh, oh, no, uh, that's, that's the end of that. We're all going to pick it up. Now, what we're going to get now is an explanation of why it has taken 21 days for this messenger to get to Daniel. So we're going to pick this up in verse 10. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. So you realize... Daniel had just fell over face first on the ground and passed out. A hand reaches down and picks him up so that he's on his knees and the palms of his hands. And it says, <clears throat> And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before the Lord. What's he talking about in those two things right there? From the first day that you started praying and fasting, chastening yourself before the Lord. That's the fasting issue there. You know that by reading earlier in, 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 in the account. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Well, wait a minute. How many, on what day, he, it's been 21 days, on what day did the messenger get dispatched? Day one, right? Okay. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days. Now the point here is that this messenger got dispatched on the very first day, but there was an entity in the heavenly places that is here called the prince of Persia that held him up and kept him from proceeding to the earth. Now, there is a kingdom on the earth called Persia. There is a supernatural entity in the heavenly places, somewhere between the earth and where God is, 
that has the responsibility of ruling over the earthly kingdom of Persia and guiding that nation on the behalf of God. But he is fighting God's messenger and preventing him from getting to Daniel. The prince of Pallady, you see that word prince in that word, that principality is in rebellion against God. He not only is in rebellion against God, but he's, a kip, uh, he's attempting to keep this messenger from getting to Daniel because what Daniel is going to hear, he's going to write down as inspired scripture. So all of that is being thwarted by the prince of Persia. Now let's go down to verse 20. Then said he, Knowest thou whereof I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. Now at the time that Daniel is giving this, that this account is happening here, who's the world power? That's the Medo-Persian Empire. It's the, the Persian Empire, okay? This cosmic messenger tells Daniel that he has to get back, why? To fight against the prince of Persia. And evidently, when that fight is over, Persia is going to fall. And who is the next one that's going to come on the scene? Well, if we continue to read here in Daniel, he would, he's going to tell you because the prince of Grecia is going to come. What's Grecia? Greece. And that is the next world power. So he's talking about the next power that is going to rise up when Persia falls. And this military messenger is not only going to fight against the prince of Persia, he's also going to fight against the prince of Grecia. Now, at that time, there are men in those nations that are governing them. As a matter of fact, when you talk about Greece, everybody wants to talk about Alexander the Great. But actually, there are principalities and powers that are actually moving men to do the things that they are doing. They're influencing them on the earth. And folks, that has never stopped. Now, we may not be ruling a nation, but make no mistake, in the 2023, principalities and powers are influencing the leaders of every nation on the planet. And it doesn't matter what their political affiliation is, those principalities and powers are still, and by the way, they're in rebellion against God, and they are moving men to accomplish their ends in the world. And it was that way then, it is that way now. Okay, so <clears throat> now I want us to turn to Daniel chapter 4. Now we know this is a, a passage on the divine council. We've talked about that a few times. The background is that Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, and, and Babylon is the world power at that time. But Nebuchadnezzar has gotten very proud and he's said and done some things in which he's kind of crossed the line with his behavior. And so a decision has been made to sideline him for seven years. So let's pick it up here in Daniel 4.16. It says, Let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast heart be given unto him. So if we didn't read the whole passage, but the thing is, he's going to go temporarily insane. He's going to wander out in the fields, uh, and, and he's going to be like an ox, you know, grazing out in the fields. He's not going to come in at night. He's just going to be like an animal. Let a beast heart be given to him. In other words, he's going to lose his sanity. He's not going to act like a man anymore. So we'll continue to pick it up here. It says, and let seven times pass over him. This actually, ha th this lasts for seven years with Nebuchadnezzar. And then in verse 17 is what we're after. It says, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones. Now, if someone is called a watcher, what is it you think they might have as a job? <laughs> 
Okay, maybe they're watching. <laughs> so my question is this. Watching what in this context? They're evidently watching Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom of Babylon, right? Now remember, these watchers and these holy ones, these are good guys. These, have not, these are not in rebellion against God. And because they see something happening with Nebuchadnezzar that they cannot allow to continue to happen. And by the way, they're not making a decision you know, unilaterally like God doesn't have any say in it. But as members of the divine council, this is a job that they've been given. They are watchers. And so when they see that, they've decided that they're going to have to do something about this with Nebuchadnezzar. And so the, the, the decision was made... Let's, let's make him temporarily insane. Let's put him out there for seven years. And then when we give him his sanity back, maybe he'll figure out that he's not God, but there is a God that is above him. And that's exactly what happens. All right, but the point that we're after here is they're not operating in opposition to God. And, 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 and so to apply that to the world, you understand that so what we have is we have evil principalities and powers that are manipulating men in the world. It doesn't matter what Kim Young, whatever, whoever that is in Korea now. The real issue is not really about him. He's being moved by principalities and powers. Putin in Russia is being moved by principalities and powers. And we don't like to think of it this way, but this country is being moved by principalities and powers. And they have their own agenda. And it outlasts the lives of men. And so Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that the root of the issue is not flesh and blood, but it's principalities and powers. Now, have you ever noticed that the policy of evil never changes? The, cu the, the culture outlives people. And that's because there's someone behind it that doesn't die. Now, let's return to the throne issue. Does Jesus have a throne? Well, he's promised one. Is he sitting on it now? He is not. So look with me now in Matthew chapter 10, I'm sorry, 19 and verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So there is a throne that the Lord is going to sit on, but it's not until the regeneration. What's the regeneration? That's the resurrection at the start of the kingdom. Jesus is not sitting on that throne during his earthly ministry, and he's not sitting on that throne during this dispensation of grace. Look with me in Luke chapter 1 and verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, by the way, the, this is about the birth of, of Jesus here. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now the Lord is promised a throne, but he is not sitting on it yet. It's not a heavenly throne. This, this is an earthly throne. David's throne was where? It was on the earth, in Israel, in Jerusalem, not in heaven. And listen, and not in your heart. That was a visible, physical, material throne. Now, it's important to get the timing right. Someone can put up a sign. I see these signs. When I travel to Glen Rose, I see all these signs that go up along the highway. <laughs> I see church signs. That, that they post things, and I, I see things that are just posted on the highway by religious groups. You can post a sign that says, Jesus is Lord over Dallas. Is he? 
Not today. Not today. You can say, and people say this, Jesus is Lord over all. Is that how he's functioning right now today? By the way, I'm going to go back to that thing I told you earlier. This is why people get unhappy with Jesus is Lord over all. And now people want to go, oh, well, then he's responsible for all the things that are going in. No, he's not Lord over all. He will be, but he is not right now today. So don't blame it on him. Let's go back to Matthew 25, 30, uh, 31. And when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Now, is that his first coming or second coming? That's his second coming. Take a look, verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king, ah, not a prince anymore now. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you bless my father, and inherit the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world. He doesn't sit on his throne on this earth and become king until he returns to put down his enemies and set up his kingdom. That is a certainty. And, and, when, the, and when the Lord returns at, at the end of his prophetic program with Israel to, to set up that kingdom, he has a name that is given to him. And when I say name, I'm not talking about the name Jesus. That's the appellative by which he is called but the name is his position or rank as it applies to his earthly rule. Now I want to show you this in the Oxford English Dictionary. That I'm not making it up. Well, I guess I am because I was going to show it to you, but I guess I didn't do it. So it's in your notes and it says this. A title of noble or ecclesiastical rank. That's the def one of the definitions for the word name. And I gave you a, a, a couple of, of uh, citations where it got used that way in the English language. So you can see I copied it right out of the dictionary. So the word name is used in more than one way in our Bible. Sometimes it's just how we normally think of it. It's just how we're called, how, what, what, what we're known by. My name is Michael. All right. But one day in the heavenly places, I hope to have another name. That name will be a position out of which I will make decisions on the behalf of the Lord Jesus and glorify my heavenly Father. That'll be my rank. Now, an angel appears to Joseph, and he says over in Matthew 1.21, sorry, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's his appellative. That's, his, that's, that's the name by which his family just called him. That was not about his rank or his position of authority. Now let's turn to Philippians 2.9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Can I just tell you that the whole time I was in Bible college when I saw that, I thought that was just talking about the name Jesus. No one ever explained to me that a name was a rank or a position. And I just thought, yeah, they've given him a name. So I guess the name Jesus is just better than every other name. That's, <laughs> that's not what that was about. In fact, because I understood that, it actually bothered me when my professor would say in the Hebrew, Joshua, that's the name you're reading in the New Testament of Jesus. And I kind of didn't like it that somebody else had the name of Jesus because he had a name that was above every name. They don't get to have that name. In fact, I remember a friend of mine actually got in a fight outside of a store because there was a Hispanic guy there named Jesus. And he didn't like the fact that he has the same name as Jesus. Oh, my goodness. All right. 
Because here's this next verse. Look at Philippians this is 2.10. This is the next verse. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. What's, what are we talking about here? Well, in the old way of thinking about it, we thought, yeah, when they call out the name Jesus, man, everybody just bows down. But that's not what's being said here. What's being talked about here is at his rank, at his position. On the earth, what will that be? King of kings and Lord of lords. And so everyone is going to submit to that authority uh, on this earth. But this says not just things in earth, this says things in heaven. Things in earth and things under the earth. So, at his name, every knee is going to bow. Now, there is submission for those that are in heaven. But you notice Paul doesn't tell you what the name is. I'm going to tell it to you today, right here at the end of today's session. What have we got left here? Okay, we're great. So, last Tuesday at Glenrose, that someone came up to me and said, Hey, I want to tell you what I think the name is for the heavenly places. And I go, okay. And they got it right. Last week in the chat, Eric Fleming, you know, that Eric is really a smart guy, kind of flies under the radar, you know. But listen, he actually said it in the chat last week. Now, I don't ever see that, that someone told me. And they said, hey, Eric said, hey, I think it could be, and he got it exactly right. He nailed it. I've had some people that contact me during the week, and they're going, is it this? And, they, and <laughs> I, I really appreciate Sue's opinion, because she don't want to take up my time. She goes, just answer yes or no. Nope. Is it this? And then other people are going, is it this? Is it this? So my texts are like, Nope, 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 <laughs> nope. But those are good guesses. Those are good. I'm glad, I'm glad people are looking at it and they're interested in it. And so I'm going to give it to you today because, again, we know what it is on the earth, but what is it in the heavenly places? Well, you're not actually going to get that name given to you until you get into the pastoral epistles. First Timothy. But we're going to go over and take a look at it. Now, we're not going to do a big study on it. We'll save that for when we get into 1 Timothy. But here it is. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15. Which in his times... Stop right there. Why is it times plural? Because he is about to tell you the name for the times on the earth during the kingdom and the times in the heavenly places with the body of Christ. And he's going to list both names here. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. There's the name for the heavenly places. The king of kings and lord of lords. There's the name for his times on the earth in the kingdom. He put both of those together right there in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now, you may look at that and go, well, I'm kind of underwhelmed. I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I was expecting more. <laughs> I feel like people are, are thinking, I had, a, I had a buddy when I was really, um, my first year in college, and the Lord really got a hold of my heart. I mean, not, not, but... Um, I had a buddy, his dad had kind of grown up locally, never really been anywhere, never went in the service. And uh, they took a vacation out to California. And he was standing with his grandpa, just kind of knee deep in the Pacific Ocean. And knowing that his grandpa had never been there and seen that before, he said, Grandpa, what do you think? And his grandpa said, I thought it had been bigger. Okay, I feel like that's how you're looking at this verse. Blessed and only potent. I thought it would have been bigger. I thought it would have been better. But when you realize what's in that, 
you know what you'll realize? It doesn't get any bigger. And I will talk about that, not today, but I do want everyone to kind of see what that is. By the way, you say, well, wait, he has two different names. Why doesn't he do King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Because it's over different realms. And that is not unusual. The Bible that we use is called the King James Bible, right? Let me ask you a question. King James the first or King James the fourth? I'm, I'm not trying to trick you about history. Here's what I'm trying to say. King James is a descendant of Henry VII. And because of that, he's in line to the throne. But because, some, because Henry VIII came to the throne after Henry VII, kind of makes sense, doesn't it? It's his dad. So his dad's off the scene. He comes to the throne, and he's got that. And guess what? James is King James IV of Scotland. That's part of the United Kingdom, but it's just not, not the whole United Kingdom. He's not England, it's just Scotland. He's King James IV of Scotland. Guess, guess what has come before him? King James the third, second, third. yeah, okay, so you get it. But wait a minute, when something happens now, all of a sudden, he is the next one in line for the throne in England? He, at the same time, he is King James IV, the fourth of Scotland. He becomes King James the first of the United Kingdom. Two, they're, they're real, two different things. Which one of those is the, has the greater authority? The King of Scotland or the King of the United Kingdom? Yeah, the King of the United Kingdom. It, it has the greater authority. Now, he holds both titles. So he didn't just wipe one away and just use one for everything because it was really two different realms. That's the way this is happening with the Lord Jesus. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords on the earth, and he is going to be the blessed and only potentate in the heavenly places. Now, you can say, well, he's going to be the head of the body. He is... And that's his function, but that's not his name. Anyway, we'll talk about that. We'll have an opportunity to actually talk about the potent thing, potentate before we get to 1 Timothy 6. But when we get over there, then we'll kind of flesh out all the details about that. Oh, okay. Um, so what we're going to do now is just say that um, we'll, we'll talk about some of this next week when we finish up our study of thrones and we start taking a look now at dominions. Uh, if you're watching this video and you're not sure about where you would spend eternity, look, we do care about you. And we care about you enough to tell you that Christ died on the cross so that you could be saved. And if you'd like some information about how to do that, if you're not sure where you spend eternity, but you would like to be, and you would either like to get some kind of information or you would like to talk to someone, let me give you a way here to um, contact us. You can contact us by phone at 888-605-3202 and just say, hey, I'd like to talk to, with somebody about being saved. Or can you send me some information about how to know for sure that when I die, you know, I can have eternal life. Or you can email us at, I'm sorry, I got that wrong, MBI Studies Staff at gmail.com. So you can either email us or call us and we'll be glad to help you out with that. Now, if you're already saved, we care about you too. And if you're interested in studying the Bible, or you're thinking there's more to this than what I've been experiencing, then let us help you study God's Word in a way that will change your life. So if you'll contact us by these means right here, we'd be glad to send you some studies and some other resources to help you in your walk with the Lord. So thank you, and God bless you.